Which beloved restaurant chain was driven out of business by a deadly hepatitis outbreak? Keep watching to find out. In the mid 20th century and beyond, family style diners were a big deal in the Western United States. Caro's consistently attracted customers seeking familiar foods in an unpretentious environment. Founded in California in 1970 as Caro's Hickory Chip Restaurant, the company sold to Flagstar in 1996, which at the time also controlled the competitor chain Denny's. By the time Caro's was sold again in 2015, only 50 outlets remained, all in California, Arizona, and Nevada. In 2018, competitor Sherry's Cafe and Pies bought out what remained of the Caro's operation and continued to do business under the well-established brand name. The new owners left just one Caro's open, the original location in Cerritos, California. That one closed for good in 2023. There's something about a buffet that's irresistible or rather a whole lot of things. Buffets like Old Country Buffet and Hometown Buffet once dominated the scene. Hundreds of restaurants owned by each company operated out of huge restaurant spaces with dozens of items ready to go at any given moment. Following some mergers and corporate realignment, Fresh Acquisitions LLC and Buffets LLC wound up controlling a large chunk of the American buffet restaurant market. COVID-19 restrictions designed to slow the spread of the coronavirus hit communal-oriented restaurants, like buffets, especially hard. Not really able to subsist on takeout like other eateries, most buffets stayed closed for long stretches in 2020, and when they reopened, operators found they'd lost too many months of revenue. In 2021, the buffet chain's parent operation filed for bankruptcy, resulting in the demise and closure of Old Country Buffet and Hometown Buffet. A midway point between fast food and serve-yourself buffets is the casual cafeteria, most predominant in the South. The modern cafeteria concept originated with the first Morrisons, which opened in Mobile, Alabama in 1920, with full meals of Southern-style home cooking costing about 30 cents, far less than traditional sit-down restaurants at the time. Morrisons was a hit, and within a week of opening, more than 1,000 customers dined there daily. Uniquely suited to enduring the Great Depression because it cost so little to eat there, Morrisons grew into a chain of 17 cafeterias cafeterias around the South by the early 1950s. After merging with the Ruby Tuesdays restaurant chain, Morrison's itself grew to a string of 142 outlets. In 1998, the first name and cafeteria started to disappear when competitor Piccadilly Cafeterias purchased the entirety of the since-renamed Morrison restaurants for $46 million. Piccadilly filed for bankruptcy in 2012, however, and by 2018, the only Morrisons left was one in the company's hometown of Mobile. Having opened its first location in Kansas in early 1921, White Castle proclaims itself the first ever burger fast food chain. I want 30 sliders, five french fries, and four large cherry cokes. I want the same except make mine diet cokes. The company's success inevitably inspired competitors and imitators. In 1926, John and Thomas Sachs opened the similar-looking restaurant White Tower in Milwaukee. Shaped like a castle and painted white to imply cleanliness, White Tower offered an alternative to downtown Milwaukee's bars and taverns with a simple menu of inexpensive hamburgers, ham sandwiches, pies, and donuts, and it was open 24 hours a day. After losing a trademark infringement suit brought by White Castle's operators, White Tower was ordered to remodel its buildings, pay a royalty to the older burger chain, and never open a restaurant in the same market as a White Castle. Nevertheless, at the beginning of the 1950s, White Tower's parent company operated 230 restaurants around the country. But those many White Tower outlets that's gradually began to disappear. As freeways appeared and population centers moved out of cities, where many of the company's restaurants had been built, business suffered. The parent company rebranded as Tom Brock Corporation and decided to focus on real estate instead of restaurants. By 2008, only a single independently owned White Tower remained in Toledo, Ohio. It was closed indefinitely after a fire in 2022. 
A Southern California staple in the mid-20th century, Pup and Taco offered a unique menu that served both fast food standards and regional cuisine before it became internationally popular. Pup and Taco sold hot dogs, kraut dogs, and chili dogs, as well as tacos, burritos, and refried beans. To compete with the bigger brands, Pup and Taco also added burgers to the menu. The first in the chain opened in Pasadena in 1965, and at its height, around 100 Pup and Taco shacks existed, almost entirely in the Southern California area. While Pup and Taco built up a regional fan base, another Southern California based Mexican style fast food restaurant aggressively developed into a national concern Taco Bell. In 1984, Taco Bell's parent company, company Pepsi spent $50 million to acquire 99 Pup and Taco locations, and then promptly shut them down. Howard Johnson's was once the largest restaurant chain in the U.S. It started out as a small soda fountain in Quincy, Massachusetts. In 1925, the restaurant's owner passed away, leaving his 27-year-old son, Howard Johnson, to take over. Johnson renamed the shop after himself, amped up promotion, and most importantly, revamped the shop's ice cream recipe. It worked, and business boomed. Johnson opened a few more locations on his own, and then, realizing just what a success he was sitting on, partnered with a local businessman to expand even further, creating one of the first modern-day restaurant franchises. It even expanded into the hotel business. Sadly, that expansion also set the chain up for incredible failure in the mid-1970s, when the U.S. energy crisis hit. Gas prices soared and travel plummeted, slashing into the company's profits. Hojo's couldn't compete with new menus and cheaper prices like McDonald's. Today, Howard Johnson hotels are still around, but those iconic orange-topped restaurants are little more than a distant memory. The popular Red Barn chain of restaurants was founded by a trio of restaurateurs in Springfield, Ohio in 1961. Never known for subtlety, Red Barn was a group of country-themed fast food joints that were shaped like barns and painted bright red. Despite the rustic exterior, Red Barn was known for being ahead of its time when it came to the food it served. Gigantic gourmet burgers known as the Big Barney and the Barn Buster were similar to the Big Mac and Whopper of later years. Red Barn was also the first chain to let customers have salad their way, with a massive self-service salad bar filled with countless salad fixings and every type of salad imaginable. At its peak, there were between 300 and 400 Red Barn restaurants dotted across America, according to Red Barn history site Barn Buster. But as tastes in the country changed, business slowed, and the chain was sold several times. The chain was never able to fully return to its glory days, and all Red Barn operations ceased in 1988. Although the name Burger Chef may only sound familiar today to fans of AMC's Mad Men, there was a time when it was one of the biggest fast food chains in America, with more than 1,200 locations across the country, second only to McDonald's at the time. Throughout its history, Burger Chef was considered an industry innovator. It was founded by brothers Frank and Donald Thomas in 1954. Prior to its launch, the duo had already made burger history. The brothers helped develop the Flame Broiler, which enabled Burger Chef to pump out 800 burgers per hour, a higher rate than that of McDonald's at the time. Under their leadership, Burger Chef was the first fast food company to market the burger, fries, and drink combo meal, dubbed the Triple Treat, which sold for just 45 cents. They also introduced the first fun meal for kids, with mascots like Burger Chef and Chef Yo-Yo, and even partnered with Star Wars for a historic promotion, offering cardboard droid puppets. McDonald's Happy Meals appeared soon after, and Burger Chef sued, forcing McDonald's to settle out of court for trademark infringement. Sadly, as big as Burger Chef was, it couldn't withstand emerging competition from upstarts like Wendy's. In 1981, Hardee's scooped up Burger Chef for $44 million. The remaining locations were all converted into Hardee's, and Burger Chef said goodbye for good. Considering its affordable all-you-can-eat salad bar, unlimited beer, wine, and sangria, and massive portions of hamburgers, steaks, ribs, and chicken, it's easy to see why Beefsteak Charlie's was a restaurant lover's dream in the 1970s and 80s. Born in NYC, the first Beefsteak Charlie's was a popular sports bar that opened way back in 1910. After the success of the original restaurant, and realizing the name had never been officially trademarked, restaurateur Larry Elman poached the name and legally renamed his steak-and-brew chain Beefsteak Charlie's 
Charlies in 1976. By 1984, there were more than 60 beefsteak Charlies up and down the East Coast, all of which epitomized the chain's slogan, I'll feed you like there's no tomorrow. In a 1982 review of Beefsteak Charlies, the Washington Post reported that what drew consumers to the place was its reputation for, quote, no restraint whatever. Instead, customers could get massive amounts of food for pennies on the dollar. Unfortunately, that opportunity for self-indulgence wouldn't last. In 1987, the chain sold to Bombay Palace Restaurants, which filed for bankruptcy just two years later. By the early 2000s, all the Beefsteak Charlie's restaurants that remained had shuttered. As LA landmarks go, few spots can compare with the famed Brown Derby, the large brown hat-shaped restaurant that opened for business in 1926. Designed to be iconic, the restaurant and its three additional locations became a playground for Hollywood royalty, with its wall of celebrity caricatures becoming world famous. Actors like Groucho Marx, Rita Hayworth, and Clark Gable were all regulars, and the restaurant was featured in movies and TV shows like I Love Lucy. That's it! That's where we'll go! Where? The watering hole. Fellow hunters, we're going to the Brown Derby. And the Brown Derby's food was incredible. The Cobb salad was invented there and was named after owner Robert Howard Cobb. The restaurant also claimed to be the home of the original Shirley Temple drink, and its namesake seems to agree. Regrettably, the glitz and glam of the Brown Derby empire faded over time. In 1980, the first Derby location closed. Within five years, the remaining locations had closed as well. Today, people looking to catch a bit of the Brown Derby legacy are left with memorabilia in museums or the Brown Derby tribute at Disney's Hollywood. Hollywood Studios in Orlando. But nothing compares to the fabled original chain and its ties to classic Hollywood lore. It's fairly common for country music stars to expand their brands by branching into new areas like food and drink. In 1991, the gambler himself, Kenny Rogers, teamed up with a former KFC CEO to open his own rotisserie chicken business. Kenny Rogers Roasters began in Coral Springs, Florida, and quickly expanded to include more than 350 restaurants. Although it started strong, the chain faced stiff competition from the likes of KFC, Popeyes, and Boston Chicken. Kenny Rogers Roasters did get a publicity boost of sorts, from an iconic Seinfeld episode mocking the chain, but it wasn't enough. Oh, Jerry, look! I need that chicken! I gotta have that chicken! I don't need those roasters alone! Kenny never hurt anybody! In 1998, Kenny Roger Roasters filed for bankruptcy and was bought by hot dog giant Nathan's Famous Inc. for $1.25 million. A decade later, they too sold the chain, this time to a franchisee based in Asia. Although it's vanished from the American fast food scene, the chain is still thriving in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Dubai. Crumb's Bake Shop got its start in 2003 as a small mom-and-pop-style bakery located in Manhattan's Upper West Side. Driven by a booming Sex in the City-inspired cupcake trend at the time, the bakery was an immediate success and grew to a remarkable 70 stores in 10 states within a decade. For a time, customers couldn't get enough of the giant, sugary, candy-topped cupcakes that came in decadent flavors such as milkshake, peanut butter cup, cotton candy, and strawberry pink Cosmo. But much has been written about what Crumb's Bake Shop did wrong and what led to the downfall of the once-beloved chain. According to the Washington Post, the company expanded far too quickly at a time when profits within single shops were already starting to decline. While individual shops were once making more than $1.2 million per location in 2009, by 2013, Crumb's Bake Shop was in the red, losing more than $18 million. Combine these losses with a cupcake fad that was also losing steam, plus vast competition from countless other restaurants and chains that also amped up their cupcake cake production, the chain was sadly doomed for failure. In the summer of 2014, all Crumb's bake shops were closed and the company filed for bankruptcy. The chain was sold to TV entrepreneur Marcus Limonis, who revamped the business and tried to bring it back, but those efforts failed as well. In 2017, all remaining Crumb's locations sadly closed for good. For many, Chi Chi's was the first place they ever got a taste of a chimichanga. Chi Chi's was also the restaurant responsible for putting fried ice cream on the menus of Mexican restaurants across the U.S. For a while in the late 1980s and early 1990s, this restaurant giant was the epitome of sit-down, casual Tex-Mex dining. Chi Chi's was co-founded in Minneapolis in 1977 by former Green Bay Packers star Max McGee and restaurateur Marno McDermott, whose wife went by the nickname Chi Chi. 
The marketing worked, and by 1986, the chain had exploded to more than 200 different locations across the U.S. As with all the most popular brands, competition gradually weakened the Chi Chi's brand. By the end of the 90s, just 150 locations remained. Desperate for financing, the struggling chain filed for bankruptcy in 2002. And then, just a month after the filing, disaster hit. Green onions imported from Mexico that were tainted with the hepatitis A virus were served at a Chi Chi's near Pittsburgh. The outbreak, which caused a massive media stir, sickened more than 650 people and killed four. Customers left the chain in droves and sales plummeted, causing the remaining restaurants to eventually close as well. The only place you'll find Chi Chi's in America is in the grocery store, where Chi Chi's branded products remain on the shelves. Horn & Hard Art isn't just a restaurant chain that has completely disappeared, it's a restaurant concept that's almost extinct in the U.S., the Automat. Developed in Berlin in 1895, an automat is a type of fast food restaurant where all the foods for sale are served through vending machines with virtually no human contact. Horn & Hardart was the undisputed king of automat restaurants, expanding to nearly 180 locations by 1950. Sadly, fast food chains destroyed the automat, and the final Horn & Hardart closed in 1991. Today, you can still buy Horn & Hardart coffee, but that's the only remaining link to the original American automat. Restaurant goers who were lucky enough to have sampled the Lum's menu while it was available often debate over what was better. Lum's famous hot dog, which was steamed in beer and paired with a sherry-infused sauerkraut, or the Ollie Burger, which contained a hamburger patty packed with a top-secret blend of 32 spices. For the record, both camps are right. The Florida-based fast food chain was home to some of the most unique food ever served in a casual restaurant setting. The secret is they steamed them in beer. There ain't a better hot dog in America. Lums was started by brothers Stewart and Clifford Perlman in Miami Beach in 1956. By 1961, they'd expanded to four restaurants. That number had grown to more than 450 locations at the height of Lums' popularity. Business was so good that in 1969, the brothers were able to purchase Caesar's Palace Las Vegas for $60 million. Two years later, they sold the chain to John Y. Brown, the former chairman of KFC and then owner of the NBA's Buffalo Braves. It was Brown who brought the Ollie Burger to Lums having bought the secret recipe for an industry-rattling $1 million. Lums is also famous for having TV pioneer Milton Berle as its spokesperson. But even Uncle Milty couldn't save the chain from filing for bankruptcy and closing most of its locations in 1983. The last remaining Lums, which was in Bellevue, Nebraska, closed in 2017 after 49 years in the business. But those who want to try a taste of burger history need not fear. The Ollie Burger is still available at Ollie's Trolley. In 1969, three fried fish chains all opened for business in the United States, Long John Silver's, Captain D's, and Arthur Treacher's Fish and Chips. A quintessentially English combination of fried whitefish and french fries, fish and chips had been an omnipresent fast food in Great Britain for decades. Arthur Treacher's presentation was decidedly more British than its competitors because of its heavy use of malt vinegar and the involvement of its namesake, Arthur Treacher, the sidekick on the popular The Merv Griffin Show, and a well-known character actor for his many roles as a stuffy English butler. Arthur Treacher's aggressively expanded in the 1970s, branching out from its Columbus, Ohio beginnings to a chain of 826 restaurants by decade's end. According to the Lakeland Ledger, there were way more Arthur Treacher's than the customer base merited, and parent company Orange Co. sold the chain to frozen fish processor Mrs. Paul's Kitchen in 1979, which sold it to Lumara Foods three years later. Following a Chapter 11 bankruptcy filing in 1984, the chain shrunk to just 27 outlets by 2010. By 2020, there was only a single freestanding Arthur Treacher's Fish and Chips left, not far from where the chain began, in Columbus, Ohio. Plenty of all-you-can-eat buffet-style restaurants have carved out a niche, like Old Country Buffet, Golden Corral, and Sizzler. But Soup Plantation sold something different than endless plates of rich and hearty comfort food and fast food favorites like fried chicken and mashed potatoes. Soup Plantation, or Sweet Tomatoes, as it was known outside of its birthplace in California, pitched itself as a healthy restaurant, offering a supersized salad bar with dozens of leafy greens and appropriate toppings, along with soups and baked goods. An outgrowth of the California-based health food craze of the 1970s, the first soup plantation opened in San Diego in 1978 and expanded across the nation in the 1980s and beyond. 
in the wake of lockdown measures meant to slow or stop the spread of the coronavirus in March 2020, Sweet Tomatoes and Soup Plantation closed down. While many other restaurants moved to a takeout-only operational model, that proved difficult for a buffet-style business. What was only supposed to be a temporary shutdown became permanent just two months later. In May 2020, after losing $1 million a week since closing down, parent company Garden Fresh shut down all 97 remaining locations of both Sweet Tomatoes and Soup Plantation. For nearly four decades, countless kids growing up on the west coast of the United States and Hawaii must have felt pretty special and lucky if they got to have their birthday party at Farrell's Ice Cream Parlor. Not only did guests receive a free ice cream sundae on their birthday, but the whole place had a non-stop party vibe, flavored with a turn-of-the-20th-century sensibility, with staff in 1890s stripes and boater hats running around serving banana splits and gigantic ice cream mountains as a player piano loudly churned out ragtime and old-timey tunes. After starting Starting out in Portland, Oregon in 1963, there were 130 Farrell's locations in all by the mid-1970s, shortly after the chain was acquired by the Marriott Corporation. By the early 80s, Farrell's had been sold to an investor group, and by 1990, only a few were left, as the novelty of an 1890s ice cream parlor wore off, coupled with increased competition from other ice cream and frozen yogurt chains. In 2019, the last Farrell's closed down, bringing the long history of the historical chain to a close, at least for now. Launched in Dallas in the mid-1960s, Steak & Ale defined mid-century suburban sit-down dining. Appearing on the restaurant scene when steaks were perceived as a rare treat for the rich and fancy, Steak & Ale brought steakhouse fare and vibes to the masses at affordable prices in comfortable, old English-inspired dining rooms. The chain also helped popularize such now-standard restaurant practices as dinner items on sale at lunch for less money, an all-you-can-eat salad bar, and free soda refills, alongside its menu of steaks, chicken, and pasta dishes, and a large selection of wine and beer. As of the mid-1980s, and under the ownership of Pillsbury's restaurant group for several years, 280 Steak & Ale outlets were the setting for hundreds of thousands of celebrations and date nights. Steak & Ale was ultimately crowded out of the casual dining sector it helped popularize. In 2008, then-owner Metro Media Restaurant Group filed for bankruptcy, according to CNN. Every steak and ale immediately closed down, as did all of Metro Media's company-owned Bennigan's outlets. Franchise-operated locations of the latter stayed open, however, and 10 years later, the remaining ones offered fans of the original steak and ale the chance to experience some of their favorites again. Three items from steak and ale debuted on the Bennigan's menu in 2018. The Kensington Club, an 8-ounce sirloin topped with a proprietary glue Lays, cheese bacon and wine mushroom topped smothered chicken, and pineapple heavy Hawaiian chicken. Coffee isn't a nut, so the name of canned ground coffee chock full of nuts is a little confusing. However, the company started out in 1926 as a store on Broadway in New York City that sold nuts. Six years later, after the Great Depression rendered nuts an expensive indulgence, founder William Black converted what had grown into a collection of 18 nut stores into some combination of coffee stand, lunch counter, and low-cost convenience store, dispensing a cup of hot-brewed coffee and a, quote, nutted cheese sandwich, which is cream cheese and chopped nuts on raisin bread, for a grand total of five cents. Chock Full of Nuts weathered the Depression by offering cheap food and cheap coffee, which was so popular that Black started to sell it in grocery stores in the early 1950s. They also garnered goodwill by hiring legendary baseball icon Jackie Robinson as vice president. According to the New York Times, by the time Black died in 1983, the company touted an annual revenue of $115.8 million, with 80% of that coming from grocery store coffee. The rest came from 25 Chock Full of Nuts coffee and sandwich cafes still extant in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Those all shut down by the end of the 1980s, however. In 2010, per the New York Times, the Chock Full of Nuts restaurant concept was revived as a food stand catering to nostalgic New Yorkers. The chairman of Chock Full of Nuts has asked me to tell you that our coffee's number one in New York.